Hello everybody, my name is Cristiano Ferreira. I'm a developer relations engineer on the Oculus content team. My job is to help developers make their games run faster, smoother, better, the greatest interactions you've ever seen, all that stuff. We try and handle it all. Uh, and in this talk, we worked specifically with Downpour Interactive to help port onward to the Oculus Quest. And it was a, a lively tale with a lot of ups and downs. And hopefully uh, the message that the developers can send to you will inspire you to your own path to glory. Uh, yeah, so let me introduce the uh, people from the Downpour Interactive team. We have founder and director, Dante Buckley. We have um, Brian Provan, the lead programmer, and Storm Griffith, the lead level designer. To kick us off, before we get into this, for people that haven't played Onward yet, let's check out this trailer, and then you'll get a little taste of what we're talking about. With every breath, the slightest of sound, the moment that defines us draws near. We must face the flames and be undaunted by fear. The only way is onward. Doesn't it make you want to play Onward? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so to kick us off, Dante, uh, how about you start us off by telling us about how Downpour Interactive came to be and by extension, how did Onward come to be? Oh, totally. Um, so after seeing the Oculus Kickstarter and after a few years of dabbling in VR as an enthusiast, um, I decided I really wanted to be a part of this exciting and new industry. So in 2015, Downpour Interactive was founded with the goal of building an immersive and realistic tactical first-person shooter game, a genre that was kind of missing in the early days of VR. And it's a genre that not only myself, but many people around the world, you know, really love playing in games today. And so with that, that opportunity in the market and with a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, Onward was built. Um, Onward is not a game that holds your hand. It's a game that utilizes realistic combat scenarios and mechanics and requires a lot of communication between teammates uh, to win on the battlefield. And what was once a solo passion project has now grown to become a major VR title that now encompasses an amazing team all over the world. And we've not only been able to improve Onward over the past few years, but we've been able to bring it to the Oculus Quest. And that's why we're here today. So. Yeah, so let's talk about that. So when you were first, um, I guess, like, Considering the port uh, to the quest, what, how did you figure out what was absolutely necessary uh, to keep and what was just like a kind of nice to have? Like, we weren't trying to overscope or anything, uh, but to figure out what was critical um, for the game's success. Uh, let's start with Ryan. Well, one of the most important things to us was obviously that it performed decently, uh, but we also wanted to make sure that in terms of cross-play, neither one of the platforms had any uh, benefit over the other in terms of uh, game balance. Cool. Uh, what about you, Dante? Uh, for me, I think, let me see. And in, in addition to that, another major goal from you know, cross-platform play was that we wanted to have a much bigger player base. And you know, there's a lot of players on the quest. And for any kind of multiplayer game that needs to, to survive and to, to thrive, you really need a lot of players to keep that going. And so going to the quest made a lot of sense for us. And that was something we had to consider. Awesome. And Storm, anything from the level design perspective? 
Uh, yeah, from a level perspective, we knew that we wanted to keep the original spirit of the maps intact. Um, obviously, going from PC to the Quest, we lost a lot of resources for drawing the environment. So we knew we had to make some compromises and maybe the amount of different objects we had or the amount of objects total. Um, but we knew we couldn't change like the core layout of the maps, um, both to not make our veteran players um, feel like they're being left behind and to also welcome Quest players to a new potential for their gameplay. Sweet. All right. So, um, yeah, I, I was there from the beginning and I remember, um, you know, it was, it was pretty tricky port given all things considered of the complexity of the gameplay and everything. But um, what were you thinking the moment you finally got the build to successfully deploy to Android and then actually ran it on the Quest and then saw the initial frame rate? Uh, take us through how you all felt on that. Let's start with Brian. Uh, well, the, the first build, actually, we didn't even make it to the splash screen. Um, we had to work a bit to get to the main menu. And then around Christmas time, we, we actually made it into the game. And it was quite a momentous occasion for us. The frame rate wasn't there yet, but we had our foot in the door. And uh, we started optimizing from there. Awesome. What about you, Storm? Um, well, I was initially shocked that it ran at all. As Brian said, we had a lot of memory issues. So most times you just start up the game, you'd load and you'd hit a black screen and crash. So once we finally got into the test scene that we made, which was the cargo map, I was just flabbergasted. I started like laughing to myself and saying something like, how does this work? Like it's working. Um, I was shooting a gun that shot out little pink texture puffs, but it was an amazing experience to get in there for the first time. Yeah, and uh, Dante, how about you? Yeah, I'd have to say for me, it was it was just pure joy. Um, even though it didn't run great and it looked very rough, uh, it allowed us to see what was possible and ultimately see the future. And it was the first build that, that got the spark going for the team so that we could complete Honored on the Quest. So. Yeah, I remember me in particular, when I got that first build, I like got actual like prone position on the floor and it was, it was pretty crazy, like no wire running down my back or anything. Uh, it's the little things, everyone, remember that. Okay, um, so after that, a little moment of shock, a little moment of happiness, excitement, uh, mixed emotions all around. What was the first thoughts going for him? How do I get this to perform at 72 frames per second at a super high resolution on a uh, mobile chipset? Um, Brian, I think you're a good person to start us off with this one. Yeah, so the first thing we had to handle was the memory, obviously. Uh, to even get it to run, we had to address the memory. And to do that, we dynamically loaded and unloaded things as we were using them, which is not something we were doing in the live version of the game on PC at the time. When you pick a new gun, it loads that gun and it unloads your last gun. And we used Unity addressables for this, and it was extremely helpful. And once we had memory under control, we were able to profile our other uh, bottlenecks and address them accordingly. There's always one thing that sticks out in the profiler. And if you just keep addressing that one thing, there's always room for improvement. So that's where uh, potential hammer. Going. Yep. Awesome. Uh, all right, what about you, Storm? Um, well, first, firstly, like seeing all the different scenarios that we have in Onward, um, 10 player action, bots, uh, smoke grenades, flashlights, working scopes and all that. It was originally like very daunting to think about how we were going to start tackling this issue. Um, so one of the things that helped us primarily was we had a really big team meeting. We kind of had a big brainstorming session where everyone listed what they thought we needed to achieve to get the game um, in a working state, a shippable state. And we ha once we had that itemized list, we were able to kind of pick it apart and choose not only the order that we needed to tackle those issues, but who on the team would uh, use their particular expertise to go for it. So yeah, to add a little bit, I would totally recommend on initial build, if you're using um, Unity or Unreal even, um, just smash all your textures as low as possible and uh, use the lowest LODs just to get the initial visuals on the screen and then build up from there. It's a good quick way to not hit the low memory killer. Um, yeah, and always use the profiler and see where the biggest hotspots are and continue to go from there. 
Okay. Um, so after that, after the plans were all drilled together and then you all felt like you had a pretty big game plan, uh, what were some of the biggest uh, areas that needed improvement and how did you decide to tackle them? Um, let's start with Storm first this time. Okay. Uh, so one of the biggest challenges that we had um, was actually, for me, eliminating occlusion culling. So normally in a level designer's handbook, occlusion culling is one of your first plays for optimization. Um, it'll get rid of things that's uh, in behind other things. So a building will block all the miniature objects behind it. Um, but we couldn't afford this on the CPU side uh, for quest development. So we ended up having to get rid of it. And we found that uh, we wanted to use LODs to their maximum potential here. So we started kind of abusing the quest limited visual acuity to pop objects out of existence. Um, a lot closer than you could get away with on other platforms. And uh, it worked out really well for us to allow us to eliminate that pass and then spend those resources on other things that we wanted to focus on. Nice. Uh, Brian, what's your perspective on this? I think our biggest challenge, uh, one of our biggest challenges and our biggest win was something we called internally pre-processing. We were using post-processing in the original version of Onward, and we used it for things like color correction, desaturation, and noise on the screen, and all those sorts of effects. And what we ended up doing with the Quest version was instead of doing a second pass over the screen for that, we actually do that on the world geometry itself. So every object individually is fading to black when your screen is fading to black. And that way we can do it all in one pass and it really gave us a lot of headroom. Awesome. Yeah, just for context there, like if you use a grab pass and it's the size of the massive um, quest frame buffer, the cost to store that to memory is really expensive um, just because it's proportional to the amount of data, data that you're moving. And with tile-based renders, they could take you know over a millisecond just to do that on top of the processing. So doing everything during the base pass is super important. And then um, Dante, um, do you have any, um, any insights on this as well? Yeah, totally. So uh, another big thing that we had to look out for was our draw calls. You know, you really can't get away with too many draw calls on, on a mobile platform. And for us, you know, there were two big ways that we did that. One, of course, was GPU instancing. Uh, but another big thing is atlasing your textures. You want to make sure that you're reusing a lot of the same textures um, by combining different textures onto a, a texture, one big texture, essentially creating an atlas and utilize them on different meshes throughout the scene, throughout with your players, all your prefabs, your pickups, things like that. And that way, you know, you can just save um, your draw calls and, you know, that allows you to do a lot of other cool things and yeah, atlas your textures for sure. <laughs> Couldn't agree with that more. Yeah, especially if you merge like giant environmental meshes, you, you pretty much have to atlas or use a global texture array method to make sure that you can dispatch that in a single draw call. Uh, and then, as Dante said, GPU instancing is super important for shared meshes, but they only work on the same exact mesh, and you could do different properties with mapping with instance IDs. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, I remember one of the biggest finds um, towards the end that was like we are in stressful mode um, was in the cases where you have a bunch of bots going on the screen at the same time. And you, you all have a pretty, pretty high level of bots that you can allow um, on a screen at a single time. Uh, each bot, of course, has animators uh, skinning, rendering, and their uh, unique um, skin meshes, so you can't instance them exactly. Uh, and, and you all thought of a really clever trick here, which was to use the rigid imposters um, for, for bots that are far away um, that might not be recognizable. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this. Uh, yeah, Storm, do you want to do you want to talk about it? Uh, yeah, this this one's funny. That's why I'm laughing. So shortly after we uh, got rid of our occlusion calling pass, we found that this actually had a negative effect on us um, because we were relying on that occlusion calling to cut out uh, the rendering cost of the bots' animations and. Um, we're, we're basically hiding the fact that they weren't animating anymore. So with the collusion calling gone, it didn't know to not do this, and we kept animating bots all the time. So what we came up with was what we call the Goofy LOD, which was basically um, seven cubes that resemble a human form that's kind of pointing a gun like this. And we just uh, took the texture for each character set and stretched it over that guy, 
And then we set it on a really, really far LOD. Um, so you can't see that it's just a stick guy out there pointing a gun at you. You just see someone shooting a gun and you shoot him. And then we just made the bot like fall over like this. So that's how we got rid of our uh, animation costs uh, for that. And then uh, Brian created a dynamic LOD adjustment system that uh, kept track of your, your GPU's workload, basically how stressed it was. And then it brought in LOD values based off of that metric to uh, give you a little bit more performance headroom and swap in uh, lower triangle count models when necessary. And that gave us a lot of performance headroom back. Yeah, I was giggling when you were talking too because I remember that first screenshot you sent me of Goofy LOD. <laughs> so good. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the most important, the most important part of that, uh, the rigid ones for for faraway objects. Of course, make sure the silhouette looks almost exact, so it's not like you have an edge if you're trying to kill a Goofy LOD. Uh, but also, the benefit is from GPU instancing those cubes because you can do them all in a single draw call across all bot types, which is really huge if you're trying to get your draw calls down. Okay, another super, super important, really hard to do thing is scopes. Uh, scopes are hard because like what I talked about earlier is like that resolving of the quest texture uh, takes a lot of time. Uh, and there's not really a really good way besides using a separate viewport. Um, how, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, Brian, do you want to talk about it a little bit? So scopes, um, they're, they're really important to our community. And they're really important to Onward, of course. And it was important for us to maintain a level of situational awareness around the player. And of course, to do a scope, you need to do a, a second render pass. You need to have another camera. And that means you have to do another set of occlusion calling passes. You have to do another set of frustrum calling passes. And all of that's really expensive for both the GPU and the CPU. You're basically rendering your, your entire world twice. And we talked about various ways of addressing this. We thought about lowering the resolution of the scope's render texture. We thought about blacking out the first person view of the player or filling it with a cube map of the surrounding area or something. And both of those were pretty unacceptable. Um, all right. For Onward, it's, it's really important to be able to see around you. And what we ended up doing was we just had to pretty much optimize our other systems with the knowledge that the player could be rendering everything twice at any given time. We needed the headroom uh, to, to know that scopes were going to be a thing that players were using, basically. Uh, we did do a couple of things to scopes. Of course, because the scopes FOV, its field of vision is, is so limited, I mean, it's, it's pretty narrow. You don't need to really do occlusion culling. Uh, you need to profile it, of course, but you, you might be able to turn that off and get some headroom back there. We also actually lower the render texture's resolution based on how far away your eye gets from the scope itself. And yeah, that ended up working out quite well. Uh, so that's the way we went with that. Sweet. Yeah, that method I think is super important because when it's really close to your eye, it's covering a lot of your regular screen. And if you do that first, you're going to reject all the pixels behind that occluded pixel area. And therefore, all the savings you get from all those pixels are going to get put into the scope's uh, camera. So, so scaling texture like that is actually a really smart idea, um, even though you're going to have to pay that resolve cost that we're talking about. Um, and also, if you do... Um, lower your LODs to a suitable level, you could run those through the scope site um, and force those in a culling mask if you want to. Um, awesome, thank you so much. So y'all are doing everything uh, possible in this game that is like of significant perf consequences. Uh, a lot of skin meshes, a lot of networking, you got the VoIP, you got uh, big environments. Uh, yeah, that's a lot of stuff and I want to ask, what was your guideline for for a bar of visual quality? Like, if we had to get all these core systems in, what was the guiding uh, philosophy to getting the style maintained in a suitable way where core gameplay could also be maintained? Uh, Dante, start us off with this one. Cool, cool. Well, yeah, before you get into anything with you know a port like this, you've got to do lots and lots of profiling. 
you'd be surprised what kind of things are unnecessary or could be rewritten to give you, you know, performance headroom. And once you have some milliseconds to play with, then you can really push other things and retain a lot of quality. And we were able to do a lot of that for our, the port, bringing a lot of PC quality over to it. And, you know, the profiler doesn't lie. So <laughs> it, will, it will tell you what's happening. Just listen to it. And yeah, that'll, it'll, that'll guide you for sure. Yeah, the profile is your greatest enemy and your best friend all rolled into one. Okay, yeah, uh, Brian, yeah. what are your thoughts on this one? Uh, so for me, if I had to pick a guiding principle for us, it was probably the crossplay. Uh, we needed a certain level of visual, audio, and gameplay fidelity to maintain competitiveness with the PC version. And a lot of times when we came across an issue that we needed to optimize or a problem with the game itself, we would just think about how it would affect both platforms. And most of the time we, we didn't compromise on these things and we had to come up with inventive solutions to work around them instead. And yeah, that drove a lot of our decisions. Awesome. Uh, and what about you, Storm? Um, I'd say one of, one of your core tools uh, as a level designer for the Quest would be very aggressive use of LOD, and in our cases, aggressive use of instancing for dynamic objects, uh, much like we did a fake version of the character models to get rid of their animation costs. We also created primitive versions of every weapon and uh, all of their attachments inside of the game. So we would take uh, just basic primitive cubes and make a silhouette of each individual weapon out of them. Um, so at a certain distance, the weapon basically turns into very dark cubes. And although you can't tell it um, partially due to the distance you're seeing it and maybe the resolution, uh, it's just a bunch of primitive objects there. And that allowed us to compensate a lot of the draw calls for different weapons. Player A has an AK-5C, player B has an AK-12. Normally that'd be two draw calls. But once they get far enough away, they all turn into cubes. And all those cubes instance into one draw call. And that allowed us to keep our draw calls really in check um, during a lot of the dynamic action that's going on and onward. Um, lots of players on screen, all those enemies that you see far away shooting at you, they're just shooting at you with a bunch of cubes and that's really cheap to render. So uh, aggressive use of LOD and hierarchical LOD is very key. Awesome. All right, so after going through all that, is there anything in particular that sticks out of something that like, if you could teleport back in time and then visit your past self and there wasn't some like singularity that formed there and pull everyone in and destroy the world from the back of space time, uh, what, would you, what would you offer yourself as some advice? Uh, let's start with Dante. You know, make sure that you fully evaluate certain tools and features, you know, for the engine that you're developing for, you know, especially if you're going to heavily rely on them. We, we ended up using some tools in the, in the early days that just weren't really good for us. We thought they were good. They seemed good on paper, but they were very experimental. And we, we, we started yeah. testing it, realizing later down, down the line in the pipeline when we needed to launch, oh, man, we can't, <laughs> uh, we can't use this thing. So it'll bite you in the butt later if you don't make sure that you're evaluating your tools and engine tools you know, the right way um, before you go ahead and ship. So... Yeah. All right. Good advice. Yeah, tools are a lot like relationships. They require maintenance and understanding and proper vetting. <laughs> uh, Storm, do you have any advice that you'd recommend? Um, I, I would basically tell myself keep like developing for the worst case scenario as we did through the process of making Onward for the Quest. Um, we often did profiling sessions where we would get a bunch of our testers in. We'd put them all together. Um, normally the game's 5v5, so you really wouldn't get everyone together, but we'd bring them all together, we'd have them start doing crazy stuff, uh, throw smoke grenades all over the place, drop all their uh, pickups into a pile, like start shooting guns and causing explosions. And then the places that we really need to whittle down stuck down or stuck out like a sore thumb in uh, comparison. So from there, we were able to identify those peaks in our profiling tools and um, find creative ways to get them down however that needed to be. Um, so the point where once we started getting 10 players all together and we started not seeing such dramatic frame drops, we knew that we were on the right path. Because um, if you develop for the worst case scenario, um, 
for just a little bit of time. Most of the time, the player will get out of the rendering scenario that they were in that was causing a frame drop, and you're going to be generally all right. So yeah, d- develop for the worst case scenario, basically. Try what players are going to try if they're going to try to break the game. And then if you can make that work, your game's probably going to work in regular gameplay. Definitely. I mean, there's a whole speedrunning community that does try and break people's games, and they'll try and break yours too. <laughs> All right, uh, yeah. Brian, what do you got? Well, like I said in the early days, uh, memory was one of our biggest issues. So if I had to go back in time and talk to myself, just make sure that you're keeping track of where references are happening. Uh, a lot of times, references can crawl through your singleton classes, and you'll have things loaded that you didn't intend to have loaded, uh, maybe from another level or, or something. So you really want to weaken those references uh, so that not everything is loading at the same time, if possible. And we did that with addressables. So yeah, if I had one thing to take from the early days, at least, it would be to uh, keep track of your references. Where's the wisdom? Thank you all for that. Um, so again, another space time scenario, but if you had to go back in time and then redesign the game from the ground up, um, but initially starting with standalone, is there anything that you would do different? And if not, why? And if so, what would the difference be? Uh, Storm, start us off. Um, okay. Well, I think the way that we ported the levels down to the quest was actually a very intense and necessary learning experience. It was kind of like a trial by fire. I feel like if we went back and you were to ask me to do it all over again from scratch for the platform, I probably would have made a lot more compromises in terms of the level's design. There might not have been such expansive open spaces and very long sight lines. I probably would have tried to condense it a little bit to make use of more aggressive culling and get rid of objects that are relatively close to the player instead of our current scenario where we have stuff way in the distance and you need to see it um, because someone might be using it for cover. Uh, So I would say having it do it the way that we did forced us to invent new techniques and learn a lot about the engine and learn a lot about our development processes and profiling that allowed us to ultimately make a better game. So I would say to myself, rethink what you guys think is impossible and try to plumb the depths of optimization to make sure that you've got everything out of it you can before you start cutting features and sacrificing what could be fun gameplay to what we started calling the performance god. Damn, nice. Dante, what do you think? Yeah, so just to add on to that, better scene and prefab management. And in the beginning, we weren't exactly sure how we were going to split up you know, keeping up with the PC scene and quest scene. And if you're doing a cross-platform game like, like Onward, you need to make sure that you manage that well. And I'd say just using prefabs um, is a good way to do that. And yeah, just keep good track of it and you'll do good. All right, so a lot of great tips in there. We covered a lot of ground, but I want to give you all the opportunity to uh, say one more piece. Uh, the thing that you wish that we covered here that you think is important to tell to developers. Uh, so let's start with Dante and go around. Totally. So I would have to say if there's one thing to take away from all this is to not give up. Do not give up. You know, if you have a dream, you have something you want to finish, whether it's this quest port or whatever it is you want to do, go after it, be persistent. It will work out. Work hard, ask for help. You'll figure it out. Promise that. So um, I guess another cool thing real quick is from a business perspective, going to the quest was definitely worth it. Um, It's a thriving market. It's really amazing technology. It's wireless you know, there's a lot of people playing this. So go to the quest. It's awesome. Uh, how about you, Brian? What do you think? You're, you're a human being. You're not objective. So you need to get that objective data to back up what you think you know about your own game. Because you have a bunch of assumptions about your code. And you want to make sure that you know for sure, objectively, that that code run, is running the way you think it is. So get the render dot capture get the profiling data, load it up into the profile analyzer, and get that confirmation. Uh, Because that that a lot of times you'll learn things that you weren't aware of, and you might get some big performance boosts out of that. Get over your own biases, people. We all have them, and we must overcome them. 
Storm, close us out. Uh, yeah, uh, kind of to harp off of what Dante was saying, um, don't be afraid to do things uh, the hard way. We early on used a lot of tools and stuff that we thought would solve all of our atlasing problems or solve all of our mesh combination problems or our LOD problems. You name it, there is something that could solve our problem. But in the end, uh, what we really ended up doing was giving everything a human touch. Our artists hand atlas all of the textures. They uh, hand authored all new LOD levels for all the meshes in the game. And basically anything you could touch, one of the people on our team touched it. So if you're, if you're getting down there into the mud and you feel like you're getting dirty and maybe there's not a way out, just understand you're going to be a lot more clean later on for doing all that hard work now. And keep the perseverance and you're going to make something really awesome. Thank you. All right, cool. Well, thank you all so much for coming. It was super valuable lessons that you shared that hopefully developers don't have to experience on their own. But as we've just learned from Storm, it is also important to go and face those trials yourself. So don't be afraid. You got the power within you. You always had it all along. I know you did. Uh, since profiling was such a large subject of this talk, I highly recommend it. We have amazing metrics available within there that will help you shine a light on your performance problems as well and keep your biases in check. Goodbye, everybody, and thank you for coming. I appreciate it.